open your Bibles. Really, genuinely open your Bibles. Like, I don't just say that. It's not like a thing. Like, how you doing? You know, like, uh, uh, keep bringing your Bibles. However long you've been bringing them, keep bringing them. And open them, you online, open them too, please. Title of the message this morning, Direction Setting Decisions. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> uh, direction Setting Decisions. We are surveying Judges, the book of Judges from chapter 13 to chapter 16. That's why I'm going to shorten it for your benefit. Here's the deal. Uh, some of you know I'm teaching up at Calvary Bible Institute. Uh, just absolutely loving it. Justo's in the class and, and uh, really making an impact up there. I love being up there this week talking to Justo. He says, man, Pastor Dave, you, you, really, uh, you really love being up there. You're like really, like it inspires you, doesn't it? I'm like, yeah, it does. It absolutely inspires me. My wife told me this year, look, whatever you do, you must go back and teach at the college because you're just, you know, you're just better when you do. <laughs> you're in a better place. Uh, so I, I love these students, and I see these students making these determined decisions to move themselves towards God's plan for them. And it, and it just blesses me so much. It's like, ah, you're doing it. You actually want what God wants in your life. It blesses me so much to see them committed to seeking God uh, and to being committed to kind of finding his plan and following it for their lives. And so uh, it moves me. Today, I want to look at an opposite example. Uh, uh, we learn well in what, what we call the negative sense. Like when we show something not to do, then it's pretty easy to see what to do. Today I wanna show you an opposite example of what I see in the, in the Bible college students at CBI. I think the best example of what not to do with your life in the Bible is Samson. I, I just think he's, he's at the top of the list of how not to handle God's calling and God's gifting in your life. Samson made decision after decision after decision that set the direction of his life toward destruction. That's what we're gonna look at today, how not to do it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as your word comes alive, we pray you would light it afire by your spirit and that it would stick, Lord, that it would pierce our hearts, Lord, God, at whatever age, Lord, God, for the young adults, the college students, Lord, to those who, who, Lord, can teach the young adults and college students either how to or how not to do it, we pray you just make it real to us, Lord. And Lord, we pray we would see clearly how not to handle your calling and gifting in our lives. We pray you do that for us now in your name, Jesus, amen. Judges chapter 13 is where we got to get rolling. Verse 5. Listen, I'm just going to, I have to hit a bunch of scripture, all right? It's a lot, 13, 14, 15, it's four chapters. Uh, so I got to hit them pretty hard. So if you want, have a little pen or something and just mark the chapters that I, verses that I mentioned. I'll be paraphrasing, summarizing. You can go back and read all four chapters later and it should have additional impact on your life. In Judges 13, verse five, the angel of the Lord appears to Samson's mother and tells her to dedicate Samson to the Lord before his birth. Every day is written before there is one, Psalm 139 says. And so Samson's mother dedicates him before his birth to be a Nazarite. And he becomes a Nazarite, takes the Nazarite vow, among other things, the Nazarite vow included avoiding alcohol, avoiding corpses of any kind, and allowing your hair to grow, uh, not because it's the 70s, but as a symbol of your Nazarite vow. All these things were symbols of the Nazarite vow. None of these things in and of themselves gave a person who took a Nazarite vow any special powers, uh, including the hair growth. It was just a symbol that they had committed to follow God in this 
vows. So there are two lessons in the life of Samson, and, and I can't teach them both, all right? It's hard enough to teach one. So let me just tell you that the lesson within the lesson is about God's incredible sovereignty, which Gina just prayed and spoke about. And I mean, in Samson's life, it's God's sovereignty hardcore. It's like, really, God? Whoa. I mean, it's like the kind that really takes you back because God worked for Israel's good in the midst of Samson destroying his life. God worked for God's people's good, Israel's good, right in the midst of Samson destroying his life with every decision he made. So, so that's good for God and good for God's people, but Samson still destroyed his life. The fact that God can work even if we're in the process of destroying our life with our decisions means God's sovereign, right? Ooh, man, it's good for God, not good for Samson. The end of Judges 13, verse five, says he, meaning Samson, will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. This is the God's sovereignty lesson within a lesson part because in Samson's self-destructive decision-making, uh, he actually does begin to deliver Israel from uh, the Philistines. So we will see it. And just know, listen, listen, here's the deal, okay? Just know, if you make decisions that set your life on the path to destruction, it doesn't overrule God's sovereignty. God's still sovereign, and he's still gonna work, all right? But that doesn't mean you should be like, oh good, then I'll just go ahead and keep making my decisions to destroy my life, because God's sovereign. It's not like that, okay? It doesn't work like that. Samson was a judge. He was the last judge of Israel, which is kind of a big deal. The judges were deliverers and they were leaders of the nation. They just called them judges. The time that Samson was a judge, super rough time for Israel, super rough. They had lost the Ark of the Covenant in battle to the Philistines. That's a very, very big deal. The Philistines had in essence conquered Israel uh, the, the nation, the people of Israel, they had disarmed them, they had taken all their weapons, and the people were living in subjection to the Philistines. The Philistines were in control, they were in essence not quite slaves, but they were oppressed uh, by the Philistines, that was bad. So Samson was called by God to change that, to deliver Israel, and he was given miraculous strength in order to do it. You may know that from the Sunday school stories. Here's what the stories don't necessarily make clear. Instead of delivering Israel from the Philistines like he was called to, Samson, Samson embedded himself with the Philistines, and, and literally, um, too. But he embedded himself, he became more of one of the Philistines than a, than a deliverer of Israel. Um, it's a big deal. So uh, he's deeply entangled, he gets deeply entangled with the Philistines. Chapter 14, see how we reviewed chapter 13 that fast? In chapter 14, Samson's decisions begin to set the direction of his life. Here, I think here's the thing that I really want you to see today, is, is not every decision like, you know, should I have, you know, a taco or a burrito? You know, it's not like that kind of decision. There are decisions in your life that set the direction of your life. They are direction setting decisions. And we need to be more aware of them, and we need to be aware of whether they're moving us toward God or away from God. That's the point of the message. We see it start in Judges 14, verse one. One day, when Samson was in Timnah, a Philistine town, city, Philistine uh, area, Samson was in Timnah, one of the Philistine women caught his eye. Now, if you know anything at all about Samson, you know that he was absolutely controlled by his desire for women. You know that, everyone knows it, every Sunday school teacher knows it. But listen, even though Samson's story is a great story about sexual sin and lust, 
it, that's not really the whole story. It is if you're in a men's study, okay? You just, you know, lean on that. But is a, there's a way bigger picture of Samson's life, so we can't make it just about his lust and his destructive choices uh, about women. So here, here's what we need to know. We need to know that the object that set the direction of Samson's life was women. What's yours? Right, this is what we need to know. What's the thing, what's the object in my life that has the ability to set the direction of my life? So don't make it about Samson's thing with women. Make it about your object. There's something in your life that every time you make a decision in that area, it's actually setting the direction of your life. You got it? You got that thing? Okay, let's go around the room and say no. The object may be different than Samson's, uh, but the lesson is the same. The principle is the same. Judges 14, verse 2, when he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye. I want to marry her. Get her for me. Samson was really a spoiled brat. And, and I think it was because maybe his mom, like, yeah, I mean, you know, whatever. I mean, he's dedicated to God from the, an angel of the Lord showed up when his mother was pregnant and said, you know, your son's going to be set aside as a deliverer for Israel. And so, uh, you know, that probably, that probably impacted, you know, mom and dad's view of Samson. Samson took, took really, really bad advantage of it. And so, so he's not saying, you know, like, like my son would, hey, pops, what do you think, you know? What do you think, you know? Should I use this lure or this lure for the fish? Uh, I mean, you know, it's, he's not asking for advice. He's saying, you go get her for me. You old folks, go, go get that done. He has zero consideration of what God wanted. His very first decision has zero consideration of the calling of God on his life. And so his parents tried gently to nudge him. Verse three. <laughs> Parents nudging. Uh, always seems like nudging to a parent, never to a child. Judges 14, verse 3. His father and mother objected. Isn't there even one woman in our tribe or among all the Israelites you could marry? They asked. Why must you go to the pagan Philistines, who are the arch enemies of Israel? Why must you go to the pagan Philistines to find a wife? But Samson told his father, get her for me. She looks good to me. All right, this is the definition of spoiled brat-itis, right? <laughs> it's like I could see Mr. Uh, Samson's dad bringing him to Sunday school and, and you know, our, our children's ministry director, whom I know real well, saying, Oh, that's such a lovely son you have there. Does he always talk to you like that? <laughs> right? Israelites are forbidden from marrying the, the Philistines, especially. They were the arch enemies and still are today. Samson was set apart by God as a deliverer of Israel from the enemy, not to marry the enemy, but to deliver. But Samson wanted what he wanted, so he says to his dad, she looks good to me, go get her for me. And then God's sovereignty lesson, just note this, you know, put an S there, or, you know, sovereignty or whatever, uh, right by verse four, in the very next verse, it says that God was at work within Samson's selfish demand. It doesn't mean that Samson's demand wasn't still self-centered and ignorant of God's call in his life. It just means that God was still at work. So continuing chapter 14, Samson and his parents, I, I can't go too far down the sovereignty thing because I'll never get to what I'm going today. So next time we teach Samson, we'll do it about God's sovereignty. Continuing chapter 14, Samson and his parents go back to Timnah uh, where this woman is in Philistine territory, to get her. And along the way, verse 6 of chapter 14, Samson kills a lion with the miraculous strength that God had given him, rips the 
lion's jaw and rips his face off, uh, basically. Uh, and, and then he goes on. Samson's dad works out the marriage with the enemy, does the thing, you know, uh, for the wedding, set the wedding up. So then they leave. They go back home. When they're coming back for the wedding, Samson finds the lion that he had killed previously, and there were some bees inside. And so they were making a beehive. A, what do you call that thing where you get honey? Co- honeycomb? Yeah. Um, and so Samson scoops the honey out of the carcass of the lion, eats some, gives some to his parents. This is not okay. You dedicated to God. You can't, you can't scoop honey out of a corpse, Samson. That's nah, no big deal. It's just one decision. Come on, let it go. I know I'm not supposed to touch a corpse. Why are you all on me about it? There's some honey. I killed a lion. There's honey in there. I want the honey. And so he sets aside, right, his commitment to God in a very small decision. Doesn't that decision seem like, oh, come on, God, that shouldn't be a big deal. It's just once. But it is a big deal because it's setting the direction of his life. You with me? All right. Continue in Judges 14, verse 10. It says that Samson threw a party as was the custom for the elite or upper class young men. I assure you, just as it would be today, that there was wine, expensive wine at this party. It doesn't say that Samson uh, ignored also this uh, commitment or, or command from God, but we can assume by what we know about him so far, he most likely did. So uh, you just, you get to know Samson, you're like, oh yeah, he definitely drinking some of the wine too. Um, and again, you might say, oh, come on, what's one glass of wine? Well, for a Nazarite, it's, it's um, you know, more than offensive to God uh, because of the, the Nazarite vow. So the party's going, and the bride's father wants uh, some more Philistines there. And, and, you know, if I was a Philistine bride's father, I might think the same thing. Hey, let's get some more people at this party. Not the wine and stuff, but, you know. Uh, so the father sends in 30 Philistine men to join Samson in his party so Samson can party with the enemy before he marries the enemy, right? Nazarite, dedicated to God, deliverer of Israel, uh, partying with in preparation of marrying uh, the enemy. So here's a math equation for you. Uh, you don't have to write this down, but, but listen carefully. One decision plus one di- decision plus one decision equals one direction. Not the boy band. I meant to look up a song by One Direction. Gina and Sean probably know one. Sean probably danced to him. No, no? You would. Does anybody know the, the one, one Direction? It was a boy band back in the day. Oh, Lisa knows. I can tell by her nod. A little bit. All right. I, I, don't, I don't know any songs. If anybody wants to sing one. Huh? You don't know the songs? Okay. Oh, you good Christian. I don't even know. Maybe they were Christians for all I know. Uh, anyway, one, just remember, remember, one decision plus one decision plus one decision equals one direction. That's how it works. Judges 14, verse 12, Samson decides to give uh, these 30 Philistine men a riddle. To tell them a riddle, you would say, why? And I would tell you, it was designed to get him 30 sets of fine linen garments. You might not think that's a big deal, but, but garments were a huge deal uh, in that day. They separated uh, the, the normal poverty, you know, the low class from the upper class, Samson decides he wants 30 sets of fine worldly garments. Who wouldn't, if they're dedicated to God and dedicated to delivering, to delivering Israel, why wouldn't they want to dress like, uh, what's the guy's name? His last name's Money or something? What's that preacher's name? Oh, yeah, that's a Creflo Dollar. Why shouldn't he dress like Creflo Dollar? <laughs> there is no way that's his birth name. His last name's Smith. Uh, I don't know. Uh, all right. 
So he tells these men a riddle based on the lion and the honey, he gives them seven days, which is how long the standard uh, uh, you know, engagement party was at the time. And, and instead of them trying to figure out the, rental, the riddle, they just go to the bride-to-be, and they just threaten to burn her alive if she doesn't get them the answer. I mean, it's classic Philistine approach, uh, and it's gonna be a classic as downfall, of course, for Samson. So the bride-to-be goes, on, uh, goes to work on Samson to get the answer of the riddle. Judges 14, verse 17, we read, so she cried whenever she was with him, and kept it up for the rest of the celebration. At last, on the seventh day, he told her the answer because she was tormenting him with her nagging. (laughs) Who are you saying that to? (laughs) In case you didn't hear, Bruce encouraged somebody not to go there. Uh, I'm, I, <laughs> it's enough, right? Uh, <laughs> the dramatic silence is enough of a message. I didn't have to say anything. I didn't even have to reread it. Then she explained the riddle to the young men. Women, you have great control over the men who love you. I just say that. For better or for worse, you have great, great impact. Every decision the Bible records for Samson shows him setting the direction of his life in the wrong direction. Every single decision. The Bible does not record one decision that Samson ever made that moved him towards God or God's plan for his life. Not one. Not even a little one. (laughs) So the Philistine men answer the riddle. Uh, That's verse 18. Thanks to the bride-to-be, which brings on another direction-setting decision from Samson. Remember, God had given Samson this miraculous strength to be used to free Israel from the oppression of the Philistines. And remember, back in 13.5, when Samson, when the angel of the Lord says to a, uh, Samson's mother, he will begin to free Israel from the Philistines. Well, it doesn't say he's going to do it as a good guy. It just means, you know, one way or another, this guy's going to start this. Well, here it is. Judges 14, verses 19 and 20. says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to Ashkelon, which was a Philistine town at that time. It is Israel today. It is seven miles from Gaza, and one of the favorite places uh, for the terrorists in Gaza to shoot missiles into schoolyards and hospitals in Israel. Uh, Ashkelon is uh, heavily, heavily, let's just say they have a lot of PTSD counseling there uh, from the rockets coming from Gaza. Uh, So Ashkelon's still there. And uh, he went down to the town of Ashkelon and the Philistine town and killed 30 men and took their belongings and gave their clothing to the men who had solved his riddle. (laughs) But Samson was furious about what had happened. And so he went back home to live with his father and mother. Verse 20, so his wife, unbeknownst to Samson, was given in marriage to the man who had been Samson's best man at the wedding. I don't know why, uh, but it doesn't help later. So God is at work, back to the sovereignty subplot, God is at work even in the midst of Samson's angry, self-focused decisions. But Samson's still setting the direction of his life. These decisions are still setting the direction of Samson's life toward destruction. Chapter 15. Chapter 15, Samson decides to go back to the Philistine woman and give her a goat to apologize, to make up to her. So I've never done that. I mean, I've had to, you know, make up to my wife. You know, I've had to say I'm sorry to my wife, but never with a goat. At least so far. 
<laughs> if I ever ask you for a goat to give to my wife, you'll know why. <laughs> um, when he gets there, back to Timna, where his, his, he thinks his bride-to-be is, finds out she's already married to his best man, the man who's supposed to be the best man, and it again kicks in this thing in Samson that's actually setting the direction of his life. This is the direction-setting decision of anger. Verse three, Samson said, this time I cannot be blamed for everything I'm going to do to you Philistines. Listen, Samson, you can be blamed the last time too. It's not just this time. When you went and killed 30 innocent people in order to cover a a debt from a riddle, you know, that was on you too. But this time, he says, this time I can't be blamed. And so Samson, continuing chapter 15, he takes 300 foxes, or your Bible might say jackals, he ties their tails together, puts a torch in between them, which (laughs) sounds a little like something my son would have done when he was young. Uh, you know, politely. I mean, yeah. animal lover and all. Um, <laughs> oh, long day fishing, short sleep equals dangerous time with a microphone. He ties 300 foxes together in pairs, puts a torch in their tails, and then runs them off into the Philistine grain fields. And then while the foxes are setting everything on fire, Samson destroys the vineyards and the olive groves. And here's another lesson. This could be a lesson within a lesson within a lesson. This could be the third kind of track in this story. Vengeance begets vengeance. Can, can you just, yeah, we can grasp that pretty easy, right? So Judges 15, at verse six, the Philistines take this woman and her father and burn them both to death because that's what they had threatened before. So they're like, yeah, now, now you're, yeah. And so then, and so then listen, listen, that vengeance, which came from the previous vengeance, brings more vengeance, right? So second math equation of the message Vengeance plus vengeance plus vengeance equals vengeance, right? Judges 15, verses seven and eight. Because you did this, Samson vowed, I won't rest until I take my revenge on you. Again, he's, he's referring to the death of, of the bride and, and actually her being married to his best man, but... <laughs> I mean, Samson's creating all this, right? I mean, the Philistines are the enemy, but Samson's stirring all this trouble up. Verse eight, so he attacked the Philistines with great fury and killed many of them. Then he went to live in a cave in the rock of Edom. (laughs) This is the deliverer of Israel. And he's just so far off the rails that, that, he is not helping God's people at all. He's killing a bunch of people, but it's out of his own personal issues. It's out of his revenge and anger and self-focus. And, and then once he really kills a bunch of them, he goes to hide in a cave and nurses pride, right? Just nurses bruised pride. Oh, big, bad Philistines. So vengeance begets vengeance, and so the Philistines take vengeance. What, what, what else are they gonna do? So they take vengeance against Israel in response to Samson's vengeance, which was in response to their vengeance, which was in response to Samson's vengeance. And so the the Philistines set up camp inside of Judah, inside the area of Israel, and they just start making Israel's life miserable. They're already overlords. They're already, you know, um, oppressing, really, they call it, Israel. But now, look at Judges 15, verse 11. It says, so 3,000 men of Judah went down to get Samson at the cave in the rock of Edom. It's kind of between Gaza and Jerusalem. Um, They said to Samson, don't you realize the Philistines rule over us? What are you doing to us? Look at Samson's reply, man. This guy, I'm telling you. Samson replied, I only did to them what they did to me. (laughs) 
No wonder you're the last judge of Israel, Samson. God's like, I'm over this. I only did to them what they did to me? You have to be kidding me. Guys, Samson is a man who was dedicated to God before his birth. The angel of the Lord, which may very well have been Jesus Christ himself, showed up and set Samson apart for the glory, for the good of Israel, the glory of God and the good of Israel. But Samson has been enslaved by his own desires and his own decisions since he could begin to talk, since they could, since they could begin to write about him. So even though God still worked within Samson's dysfunction, can't we learn something from Samson about our decision making, right? I mean, it's pretty in your face that your decisions set your direction. So verse 12, the Israelites convinced Samson to allow them to turn him over to the Philistines because the Philistines had told Israel, look, we're gonna continue to make your life miserable till you give us this guy, because he's going down. So. The Israelites uh, convince Samson, uh, and so they, they tie him up with new rope, and he's just playing along, and they bring Samson to the Philistines, and then, of course, you know, his miraculous strength kicks in again. We read in Judges 15, verses 15 and 16, then he, Samson, found the jawbone of a recently killed donkey, not my favorite translation here, of a recently killed donkey, he picked it up and killed 1,000 Philistines with it. Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, I, I have piled them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I, I have killed 1,000 men. And the Lord gets zero credit. Samson is not delivering Israel. He's just going off on his own destructive tendencies, though God is using it. Samson has nothing but I in mind. He's consumed with himself, with what he wants, with what he does what he wants. He sees himself as always right, always gives himself credit, never takes blame. I don't know if you know anybody uh, like that. Um, but check men, check for the guy in the mirror does what he wants, what he does is always right, always takes the credit, never takes the blame. I mean, I just described the curse of being a man, okay? That's just what we deal with. As a side note, my favorite translation is the King James Version. Listen to that, you King James only people. My favorite version is King James here because in the King James, it says that Samson picked up the jawbone of an ass. And, and, and there's, a, there's a really famous saying in the ministry that, that every, every pastor needs to memorize. It's this, Samson killed a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass, and many more churches than that have been destroyed by the same thing. Okay, again, no need to explain. Chapter 16. Samson goes into the Philistine town of Gaza, which is still home to the Philistines and, and uh, descendants of the Philistines and the enemies of Israel today. And he spends the night with a prostitute, uh, another lust decision. Uh, and, and then he famously escapes when the Philistines try to kill him, 16-3. Uh, uh, kind of a cool story. Hard to really see in your mind. He picks up the gates of the town and carries them away. Um, finally, after all these decisions, after all these direction-setting decisions, Samson falls in love with Delilah. Finally, at the end of his life. 16 verse 4, but he's following the same direction-setting pattern. And this is what we've got to see. There are decisions that set the direction of our lives. Samson made everyone in the wrong direction. So now he's in love with another Philistine woman. So the Philistines come to Delilah and offer a ton load of money, a, a truckload of money to devise a plan for them to get to Samson. She does, as you know from Sunday school, he manages to put her off three times 
But then eventually in Judges 16, verses 16 and 17, it says, she tormented him with her nagging. When have we heard that? Uh, I can't remember. And when, women, listen. You are, you are, you are inher- inherently, by the way God designed you, more spiritual than men, okay? And you also have a secret power. And this is the second time that your secret power is mentioned, okay? (laughs) What's your secret power? Nagging. Uh, uh, Listen, listen, listen. God is all about changing us, right? He's all about transforming us in his image. So anyway, anyway, I I got off track. She tormented him with her nagging day after day until he was sick to death of it. I love the NLT. Verse 17, finally, Samson shared his secret with her. My hair has never been cut, he confessed, for I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from my birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as anyone else. Samson's hair was not his actual strength. It was a symbol of his Nazarite vow and the gift that God gave him to be a deliverer for Israel. It was a symbol, but anyway, uh, it still works. Uh, So Samson's asleep on her lap. She cuts his hair. You know this story. Verse 20 of Judges 16. When he woke up, he thought, I will do as before and shake myself free. Can I tell you the most important line in the life of Samson is this sentence. The end of verse 20. But he didn't realize the Lord had left him. Our decisions have consequences, and they set the direction of our life, and the direction of our life has consequences. And here, Samson didn't realize the Lord had left him. Samson thought that the Lord would always put up with him, because he's so cool, you know, he's Fabio, and and, you know, can carry gates around, and, and he just thought, no, no, God needs me, and God's like, you know, I don't. So God's not putting up with it anymore. Uh, you know, it's only by God's grace that he puts, put up with Samson from the beginning. It's only by God's grace he puts up with us. But there's a time when God says, no, it's time to make things right. So verse 21 of chapter 16, um, you know, things start to be made right. The Philistines capture Samson in 16:21. They gouge his eyes out. And then they turn him into a human ox and have him grind grain in their prison. And then before long, they have a festival, this great festival to Dagon, their god, their pagan god. And so they, they, they're gonna have this festival to, to celebrate Dagon and to make fun of the god of Israel within Israel territories so that Israel knows. And so they bring Samson out to make sport of him, to mess with him to make fun of him and the God of Israel. And finally, listen, listen, finally we see Samson pray. Oh, wait a minute, he hasn't prayed yet. There was one time after he killed a bunch of people that he was thirsty and he complained to God. He didn't pray, but he said, God, why can't I get a cup of water here? I just killed a bunch of people. Um, But this is the only real genuine prayer in Samson's life. Um, doesn't that, that says something, right? This is it. First real prayer of Samson's life, 1628. Then Samson prayed to the Lord. Sovereign Lord, remember me again. That's as close as he gets to repentance. Remember me again. Oh God, please strengthen me just one more time. With one blow, let me pay back the Philistines for the loss of my two eyes. <sighs> Notice even Samson's one and only prayer of repentance is not for God's glory. It's for vengeance. He never got right. Some people, you know, whatever, theorize about 
whether Samson was saved, you know, by faith. That's how they were saved in the Old Testament and New Testament. But, but I'm telling you, this prayer is for more revenge. So God does give him the strength because, again, God works within his incredible dysfunction. Samson pushes the pillars down, kills 3,000 Philistines and himself. What a life. I think it's the saddest life in the Bible. There are other sad lives, right? But this one's massive, takes up a huge chunk of the Old Testament. Samson was called by God, but served only himself. Never served God's people. He was set apart for God, but he directed every major decision in his own life. And ultimately, those decisions set his direction to destruction. That's the lesson. Guys, our decisions do set our direction. This does apply to each one of us. Here's the good news that comes from the New Testament, and really the Old Testament too. Jesus Christ came to give us the ability to change the direction of our life. That's why he came. Instead of going to hell, you can go to heaven. Every area of our life, Jesus Christ came to give us the ability to make a U-turn, to turn around. He lived and died so that you could choose a new direction for your life. Before that to happen, you have got to turn away from the direction your life is currently heading. The only way to go in a new direction is to turn from the one you're on. It's called repentance turning from the direction you're on, turning away from the direction you're going if it's away from God, and turning towards God, a path that leads you towards God. The words that start it all, the words that start it all are repent, make a U-turn, and believe, trust God. We repent. God, I'm going the wrong way. Something tells me Right when they gouged my eyes out and and made me a human ox, I I should have got the idea that maybe my life was heading in the wrong direction. (laughs) I mean, hopefully we do it a little earlier. But at some point we say, God, I'm headed in the wrong direction. I must make a U-turn. I must repent. And then the belief part means, Lord, I trust you. I'm not doing what I want. I'm not coming up with my own conclusions. I'm not bringing my own math to my own, my own you know, equation. I, I'm just going to do what you call me to do because I know that that direction is best. And so we turn from one, turn to the other. But here's a thing that maybe we miss a little bit in our cultural Christianity. Repentance and faith are not just one-time decisions. They're every day but especially every time we're faced with a direction-setting decision. We must get to this point where, we're, where we determine whether we're moving away from God or towards him, repent if it's away from him, turn towards him, and then trust him no matter what. No matter what, we have to trust God because those decisions set the direction of our lives. Here's my prayerful commitment for each of us. Let's make our decisions for Jesus Christ one at a time, one at a time. This is a direction setting decision. Lord, I'm gonna make it for you. And I can't even see past it. I can't see one day past this decision, but I know this is a decision in in your direction, so I'm gonna make it, and then I'm gonna trust you. And then, and then the next time I have that, that ability to make a decision or that requirement to make a decision, I'm gonna make it for you. And I'm gonna trust that every decision I make towards you will lead me in your direction. We cannot, we cannot see the future, and so we cannot make decisions on based, what, based on what we see. God sees it all, so we can make decisions based on who we know he is. We make them in trust in faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 is on the wall, my only cross-reference. says, for we walk, the word walk in the New Testament means to set the direction of your life. We walk by faith. We set the direction of our lives by faith, not by sight. Yeah, I can't see because I'm not supposed to, right? Because if I could see, then I would be God's equal. 
And some of you are like, yeah, and? No. <laughs> Let's set the direction of our life by faith, not by sight, okay? In every decision, may we commit to make it for Christ. Make it in the way that God has led us towards what he's called us to because those decisions, every single one, will set the direction of our lives. Amen? Just looking at Husto, any college students, especially CBI students watching, this one's for you guys. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, so many of us old in this room, Lord, so many of us who would say, oh, I wish I would have embraced that when I was young. Lord, may we embrace it now. Wherever we're at, young or old or in between, may we embrace this truth that every decision, every crucial decision we make sets the direction of our lives. May we make them to set our lives according to your plan and your purpose. And Lord, we recognize we don't know your plan and we don't know your purpose. And so Lord, we'll just make our decisions for you, to honor you, to bring glory to you as you lead us, Lord. We'll listen for your voice. We'll hear you speak in your word. We'll see what doors you're opening and closing. And we'll make one decision at at a time towards you. I just want to give you 30 seconds to do that. There's been something in your life that's been gnawing at you the whole time I've been talking, or at least part of the time. Something the Holy Spirit's brought up that you know, just between you and God, you know that's the thing that God is talking to you about today. Would you just acknowledge that to God? It's called confession. Would you just say, Lord, I know this is what you're speaking to me about today. So I give it to you. I release control. I refuse to walk by sight. And instead, I commit to walk by faith in you, in your plan, and your purposes. Please fill me with your spirit to that end for your glory in my life, Lord, and in your name.